In part two, I will shortly uh, discuss how to read your literature, because somebody asked questions about that. Uh, when do you know that you know everything you need to know? Think about that one. Um, then I will specifically address point by point how to how to write the paper. What do you put in? What and especially, and that's the most important part, how do you structure a paper? Because a paper with a wrong structure or a wrong uh, series of scales that I will come back to is unreadable and you will miss the point. And finally, publication strategy. Uh, again, coming back to the to those. H factors and citations. I mean, you might may find it boring, but if you want to do anything in science, it is crucial. So simply, if you have to do a literature review on a certain subject, uh, the way I always do it is I go to Scopus or to Easy, I type in I don't know, let's say Tibet. I did that last year. Um, you type in Tibet, you get seventeen thousand eight hundred and twenty-three hits. That's a problem. So what I normally do is I take the latest papers of people that I respect um, or in journals that are good with interesting titles. Just take the five latest and you take the best cited ones because they're probably cited for a good reason. And what you will see is if you start reading just the introductions and settings, right? It doesn't really matter what problem they solved in that paper, but just if you read their introductions and settings. You will see the references, uh, and especially if you do that for the first four or five papers, you see the references coming up, uh, you see common references coming up. And you will see that in, at the fifth paper, you can predict in the introduction which references are used. You look up those, you check whether the claims that are given to them are actually correct, and you have the outline of the, the subject that you know. You know the most important literature, you know the, the overall, let's say, picture of the region, of the problem, of the experimental setup, or whatever you do. For the rest, all you have to do is check papers, scan papers, to see what kind of additional data they gave. I'll give you an example. I type in Himalaya, there is a quazillion papers coming up. But after reading the first ones, I know the overall structure, I know the guys that did the, the, the pioneering work on it. And then I, all, all, I have to, all I have to do is, for instance, find papers that, that, that report fossils, right? I don't have to read those introductions again. You just want to know the fossils. And you make sure, and you scan it. And even on very complex subjects, it doesn't take more than a few days, actually, to get a complete overview of the literature. Okay, so if we go specifically into a paper, a paper, as you know, thesis, is built up with a title, an abstract, an introduction, a setting or background, uh, or previous work uh, section, the data, discussion and analysis, conclusions, acknowledgements, and references. And I will simply go through this step by step, but every paper is set up this way, in this order. And this is, I always use this example um, to explain how to write a paper. Memorize this one. Make sure that every paper you will ever write in the rest of your career is set up like this. And what I aim to do with drawing this, this hourglass is to show the scales of which you discuss and the order in which you discuss those scales. And what I mean by scale is that if you, for instance, nobody can uh, in one paper uh, explain play tectonics. But in the end, the research is directed towards solving plate tectonics. So you start off, Earth has plate tectonics, whole Earth, big process. Within plate tectonics, we have subduction. That is only part of it. Within subduction, we have the, pro the problem of, for instance, what, what, you, what you're writing about, that we have the problem of that a plate has to bend. And to bend it, I need to hydrate minerals. And I'm going to work on the hydration of minerals. Right? I start with plate tectonics. And I'm zooming in to a specific problem. In this particular case, CO2 emission creates global warming and ocean and acidification. Right? At least that is what we're thinking right now, and it's probably correct. Ocean acidification may threaten coral reefs. That is not, that's a smaller scale. Because, first of all, I kicked out the CO2 effect, 
or I keep telling you, the, the warming effect, I just focus on the ocean acidification, and I specifically go to coral reefs. Coral reefs in your cities is less coral reefs than all coral reefs, but there are some, and you're focusing on those. And then you're focusing on one specific reef, because you want to see, let's say, uh, you, you, you reason that from, to solve your big problem, you're zooming into one specific one, and that is the smallest scale of your paper. The smallest scale of your paper is in this case that we study something of a coral reef. Then in your setting, or your methods section, no, sorry, in your setting and background section, you tell everything about that coral reef that you did not find out yourself, but that you do need for the rest of your paper. So you indicate all the relevant information that is required, and nothing more than that. Relevant is also inconvenient, right? Don't leave stuff out that you'd rather not know. If you know it, you have to show it. But <coughs> Then the, the narrowest part of your paper is the data. It's only it's the, the it is specifically for what you have done right there. In your discussion, you bullshit all your way back to the largest scale at which you started. Yeah? Oh crap, this is film. <laughs> <laughs> so in this particular case, we found that coral reef X in New City Y is completely messed up. That has implication for reefs near cities. That may have implication for ocean acidification in general, and from that we may, may need to uh, do something about global warming and CO2 emission. If you would put this point there, coral reef X near city Y is messed up, therefore we need to change policies of CO2, CO2 emission. Oh, by the way, it says also something about reefs near cities. You go, your scales jump back and forth, and you can't follow it. Moreover, if you are writing a discussion, um, this is, not, this is not just the scale, this is also the level of certainty. You know by far most about the uh, stuff that you have actually measured. So your first parts, your first conclusions, and the first part of the discussion is pretty sure. And probably everybody that reads that paper will say, okay, fair enough, that's a useful first step. And then you go a step larger, and also a step more speculative. And the reader may say, well, okay, I'm buying that. And then you go a step larger to uh, oh well, let's say in this case the, uh, the implications for ocean acidification, we do I say, ah, bullshit. I think I don't like this one. In that case, this paper is okay, because you made a contribution, you made one interpretation, and the reader is going to take that aside you for it. And ignore all the rest, because it doesn't, doesn't agree. If you start with this one, and he says, I don't think so, this paper is in the dustbin. Immediately. Right? So make sure that every paper that you write has a scale, a large scale to start with, zooms in gradually towards the data, and then zooms out back to the same scale as where you started. If you, if you end at a smaller scale, let's say if the, if the bottom of my hourglass here is much narrower than the introduction, then you promised me in the introduction that I would learn something about global warming, but in the end all you're telling me is that there's some reef in Australia messed up. And that's not why I read the paper, because I was interested in the original problem. If you would start with a very small um, uh, top, for instance, we only, yeah, we found a coral reef and we studied it, and then suddenly in the discussion you're telling me that we have to change the policies of CO2 emission, then it's arm waving, right? So you make sure that the, that the scale at which you start is the scale at which you end, and you do everything gradually. And Inge has been hammering the point that you have to write in paragraphs, and that one paragraph should be one thought, one uh, point you make. The reason you have to write in paragraphs is that normally, especially when you're writing the paper, you don't uh, necessarily always have everything already thought up. And if you write in paragraphs, you will see in the end that, for instance, your scale does that somewhere, right? Then you simply take the paragraph and you move it up or down to where it fits. And Inge and I edit each other's papers uh, quite frequently, and, and, and proposals, and we end up a lot of time, and I did the same with the paper of Tron yesterday, simply taking, cutting the paragraph out and putting it in another position where, it's, where it flows easier. So your editing becomes much easier if you use paragraphs. I will refer to this continuously, and I actually use this a lot. So make sure that you always keep this in the back of your mind. So, 
Rule number one, keep your papers organized according to scale. As soon as you start mixing scales, you can follow the story and people may become skeptical. If you say, um, I found uh, evidence for, uh, I found a rock in the river. All rivers in Norway are filled with granite. Maybe, but it would be nice if you show a lot of steps in between to come to that conclusion. <coughs> Yeah, that's the example here. Because reef axis and that will be warming will kill us all. Maybe valid, but if you don't give this, the scales in between, nobody's going to buy it. A sweeping generalization, as we were just talking. Okay, so go to the title. The title is the most important part of the paper. Because, and, and when you're writing a paper, you have to realize exactly how you read the literature yourself. 99.9% .9 of the papers, of the titles you see, you will not read. Right? Because let's say, probably everybody gets journal alerts or those searches, and you scan titles to see whether you're interested or not. So your title should be, first of all, it should be a summary of the results. Uh, a summary of your conclusions. It's the shortest summary of your paper, but it is. it should be a conclusion. Up to the point that if people only read your title, they can still cite you. Make titles short. If you make titles an abstract, nobody can read them. They need to jump up. Make them conclusive instead of descriptive. For instance, do not say um, stratigraphy of a basin that you just have to study, but what what are you doing with the stratigraphy? Uh, for instance, major uh, drowning phase in basin. That is your conclusion, for which you need the stratigraphy, of course, but everybody who sees that conclusion can figure out what kind of data you have behind it. So it's not a description of your data, it is the conclusion that you want to convey. Again, a paper is a problem and an answer for which you need high quality data, but the paper is not the data. So the title is not a description, the title is the conclusion of the, the answer to your question. May titles positive, and I made a mistake twice, but in the same year, so when I made the mistake the second time, I didn't realize it was a mistake yet. And I did paleomagnetic research in Mongolia and in Mobiaria, and in both cases I had a fantastic data set that, said, that showed that there were no rotations which is a perfectly reasonable and viable result. So I happily wrote a paper, no rotations in Bulgaria, which has major implications for the tectonics of Greece and Bulgaria. Completely ignored. Why? No rotation reads, it reads like no result. And if I, and I will come back to that example. I may try this proper English, and I will show some examples in which that is not the case. This is the first this is the title of the first paper I wrote, and it's a horrible one. First of all, it's way too long. Secondly, the first part doesn't say anything. Vertical motion is in the Aegean volcanic arc. You don't know whether it's going up, you don't know whether it's going down, you don't know whether they are there in the first place, you don't know whether they're large or small. Colon, evidence for rapid subsidence preceding volcanic activity on Minos and Aegean. I could also have written Rapid subsidence preceded volcanic activity on Milos and Echina in Greece. That is the conclusion of the paper. Anything before that is bullshit. It's empty work. My supervisor could have told me that when I was... It took me two years to write the damn paper in the first place. So, okay, that's another thing. Uh, writing becomes easier. I promise. Great. The, this paper, the first one, um, took two years. Why did it take two years? Because I had a nice description of data, but no idea what I wanted to do with it. I mean, I knew it was going up and down, but who cares? I didn't have a problem to solve with it. And I had to invent five problems before I found one that is, in the end, totally ignored as well. <laughs> so I did 11 times. Three times not by me. Um, Okay, so no rotations reads like no result. I could have said major rotation contrast between Bulgaria and Greece, and everybody thinks, wait, same result, same conclusion actually. 
Wrong title? Ignore. This is the one, this is actually a paper that was published, Cretaceous Paleomimetic Results from Western Tibet. The results are not Cretaceous. And when I read this, I think, idiot. It's just stupid. Make sure that, and, I mean, if the title is the best read part of your paper, if that has a stupidity in it, that doesn't look good on you. Let's put it this way, even if I would not be interested in Tibet, I would still check the author. You see, you wrote this. <laughs> So you're known, but not for good reason. Besides, this doesn't tell me anything. Cretaceous preliminary results from Western Tibet show that everything is remagnetized and that we cannot draw any conclusion. I want to know what they did with it. So, title styles, this is inspired by, uh, by Albans. Uh, Abstract that he said. So this is, for instance, a title that puts uh, that puts forward. You can write it as a claim or as a rhetorical question, and both are okay. So assuming hot foot walls explain anomalously high geothermal gradients in superattachment basins. That is the conclusion. Of, I don't know whether this is actually the conclusion that you can draw, but this would be a conclusion that everybody who's working on. Obviously, he didn't study every basin on this planet. But this is something that everybody who studies those basins think, oh, that's interesting. Take it. Four questions, and this is a very, very famous one. This is the uh, the, the, the initiation of the so-called Wilson cycle. Tuzo Wilson wrote a paper in 1963 in Nature, and that said, did the Atlantic close and then reopen? And if you read that title, then the chance that he will answer that with no is not very likely. <laughs> right? It would be funny to write a paper in Nature and then say, no, 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 it was also hunched with bullshit. <laughs> so rhetorical questions are a pretty good way to catch attention. And simply simply because of the question mark. The question mark is, is a feature that stands out. So it is a nice way to... In those titles, it really works to, to, to discuss those back and forth, but it's really difficult to come with a good title. Abstracts are the second best web part of a paper. Uh, normally, the, the entire abstract is not even read. So the first and the last lines are the most important ones, as, as is the case in every paragraph. But abstracts give you, introduce the problem, so they grab the attention, the abstracts do this again. Within the abstract, you have a summary of the entire paper, so you use the, uh, the hourglass. You introduce the problem, and you say why it's cool, that, uh, the, the, or you, give, you, 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 you want to make it as, as wide as possible, zoom in to your problem in the abstract, then say how did you do it, and then what the result is and the implications, back to the original, let's say the scale of your opening sentence. People read abstracts to get the headlines. So sometimes you see most journals have a restriction on the length of an abstract of about 250 words. Uh, some journals do not, like text in the physics or so. And sometimes you see an abstract that is pages and pages, well, pages and pages not, but let's say a, a, a full page of eight sized text. Nobody is going to read that. If you make your abstract too long, paper goes out of the window or you only read it if you have to. So, even if you're allowed to make longer abstracts, keep them short, keep them 250 words or something like that. The first line grabs the attention, and the, and the last line gives the result, gives the main conclusion. Because normally, if you scan abstracts, you read the first line, you scan the text for keywords, and you read the last line. Especially if you're doing literature searches over and over. For instance, I did a, this. Um, I, I gave that talk last week with the reconstruction of Tibet. I cited 400 papers, so I must have read about a thousand. Read about a thousand. And the other 600 apparently did not tell me something that caught the attention, because you cannot read a thousand papers. If you can give results or conclusions in numbers, do it. 
because numbers stand out. You immediately pick them up if you if you scan the text. Or maybe you can do it as a as a uh, equation or something like that. But if you can if you can use um, well, I think equations of numbers are the, are the clearest example. They immediately, if you have an age or something like that, then put it in the abstract. The introduction is the di most difficult part of writing a paper. And therefore, you should start with it. Do not write the introduction in the end. Because the introduction is telling not only the reader, but also yourself, what problem you try to solve and how you're going to solve it. So the introduction is going to determine whether the data that you present are relevant, whether the citations that you give are relevant, and if you're um, first describing everything you've done, let's say that you have a lot of data that you collected, and you've described them all. And then you start writing your introduction in which you select the problem. Once you've selected that problem, it turns out that half of the data are actually useless. Not because they're bad or good, but simply because they're irrelevant for a problem. And there's nothing more annoying than reading a paper that has data that do, don't say anything about the problem it's trying to solve. I had major fights with a PhD student of mine who insisted to show diagrams of something she had measured that had nothing to do with the paper. Yeah, but it's good data, and I did it, and it's a lot of time. Yes, but it doesn't matter. So if you really want to, to publish those data, find another question, publish another paper. The introduction is the trailer of the movie. So it grabs the reader with a cool problem, and then takes, and you should do that in an entire paper. When I was a student, and you undoubtedly uh, have the same, um, you're trained to learn something and then, let's say, defend to a teacher that you actually, you have to show that you, um, uh, that you, that you understood it. You had tests. So every time that you presented something, it was defensive. This guy thinks I haven't got the clue about what he said and I have to show him, I have to convince him otherwise. Do not write your papers defensive. Do not defend if you're not attacked. So you take a reader by the hand and you explain everything. I mean, write it for your grandmother. Explain it step by step. So in the introduction, there is a big problem that everybody finds interesting. Within that problem, I'm selecting a key problem. Right? I cannot solve everything, but uh, for instance, in the, in the, in the case of the, the, what I read from the Ollie, it is key that water is the key in oceanic crust that allows it to subduct. So we start in plate tectonics, we go to subduction, we go to water, and then that water has apparently some problem. Can you explain what the problem of that water is? That we do not really understand that. And if we don't understand the water, then we don't understand plate tectonics. So you zoom into that. <laughs> and that is the end of your... Once you're zoomed in, you selected the problem, you explained the problem clearly, then you say, now, how are we going to solve this? And that's where you stop. That's the trailer of the movie. Right? You don't say what comes out, because then people don't read the rest of the paper. And you want them to read through all the, the work, because the actual work is after the introduction, but you want to show to people what you've done. So after the introduction, first of all, they should understand, it should be crystal clear what they wanted to do, what, what you wanted to do, why you wanted to do it, and how you're going to do it. Ah, cool, and now I want to see more. And start by writing your introduction. If you write a paper, start with the introduction. Because then, at the end of that introduction, then you know, and only then you know, what you're going to present. Methods, background, and setting. Give all the information there that you did not come up with yourself. Maybe for methods that doesn't apply. Should methods is a different part, especially for analytical uh, uh, stuff that, in which you simply say I use method A and I promise B, etc., etc. So this is a, especially background and setting. Give all the information that is needed to understand the paper and that you need for your discussion um, that you didn't think of yourself. In other words. The background of the setting is entirely based on literature. 
Everything is referenced. Give all the information that is relevant, and therefore also the inconvenience side. The, the theories that you think are complete nonsense. But if they're relevant, you have to show them. Give no information that is not needed and not relevant. The red herring. Don't show off that you've read a thousand papers, and it turned out that after you went through those thousand papers, 30 are actually useful. Maybe frustrating, or maybe you should learn how to do a literature research. <laughs> but um, I think uh, Inge just showed you, or, or mentioned it somewhere, do not, oh yeah, in the, in the list of how to write a really boring paper, that is giving 17 references for statements that are not so important, right? Don't give information that is not strictly necessary, but don't leave out information that is directly relevant. <coughs> Normally the background and, the, uh, and the, uh, the setting are relatively simple to write, because it's the stuff that you started reading when you started your uh, thesis in the, to begin with. But only after you define the problem, only after you wrote the introduction, it is useful to write it. Otherwise you have to delete half and add more stuff that you didn't think of before. In results, in the results section, you only present new stuff. Nothing is referenced. Anything that the, anything that requires a reference there should have gone in the methods or in the background section. So only your new stuff. Only get the relevant results. If you have cool data that have nothing to do with this. With this, uh, uh, with this particular problem, fine. Then you can write a second paper, come up with a new cool pr problem, and use the data for that. So only show the stuff that is relevant. Give representative examples. Normally, you have done God knows how many model runs, or God knows how many uh, samples that you that you collected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, give representative samples and give the most important results, not every measurement that you've done. You give summaries, you give the, the highlights, and if you be honest, again, be honest. If you write a paper, don't bluff, because it comes always back and always bites you in the ass. Never bluff. And if you're honest, then you do not give the, the most spectacular diagram that you have, that is the textbook example, and you say, this is the quality of my result. If the rest is actually kind of shitty, because you get away with it, um, you got the paper published. So many reasons things. Well, I've reviewed papers that I thought this is too good to be true, but you can't say that because maybe this guy is a genius. You can't say it, but if you say that this is crystal clear and you know damn well that maybe not entirely. Then later, um, first of all, somebody may show you that you're absolutely wrong. Or worse, you show yourself that you're absolutely wrong. And if you really make very strong claims, then either you have to say, I was wrong, which looks bad, or, and this happens actually quite a lot, or you stick with something that you know is nonsense, but that's what you build your career on. And there are honestly examples in, in the field that I'm in that I think, come on guys, you must know that this is bullshit. But you just stick with it because you, you build half your career on it and you made such strong points. Whereas if you would have said, you know, it's a nice idea, maybe, maybe it works, then you don't have to defend it for the rest of your career and you can actually progress. Never mix results with discussion, results with interpretation. Nothing is more annoying than reading something, um, I have found a rock, therefore it must have been like that and like that. If you mix your ob results and observations, people are not going to believe you. Simply, clearly and honestly show this is the result, and then later you have every freedom to interpret what you want. But if you say, I have now let's say you have five results, and after the first result you already discussed the implications of those results, and then you go to the next result, you're not going to believe the rest anymore because you're already massaging into a direction. Don't massage, don't bluff, never mix. 
Don't compare in the results section your results with some something that somebody else has done. Because again, it's defensive. Uh, I have found in the field that the stratigraphy is 100 meters thick, which is correct because somebody else has already said that. Next sentence, new result. I don't care what the others have said. If, there's difference with, if there are differences with the others, then you discuss that later in your discussion. Just show your observations. And you end your results section with a conclusion. For instance, in this case, all 560 test, uh, 560 test mice drowned within seven minutes on the water. That is a conclusion of your results, the, the summary of your results, and that is the starting point um, for the discussion of the paper with the title The Differences Between Fish and Mice. But give a, give a conclusion at the end of the... I mean, again, take the reader by the hand, after the, uh, if you if you very honestly describe all your data points, and you have listed tables and tables and tables and tables with measurements, it is nice that you give a bit of a summary or a main point of all those tables because it's great that you did that, but I'm not going to read all that. And we move on to the discussion. I guarantee you that and I do that from experience from myself, that um, if you would, that in the papers, the paper that you're working on, if you go to the discussion, you can delete the first paragraphs. Probably. Because normally, especially if you're writing a paper while you're still thinking about it, what you do is you get for, sum for yourself a summary of all the results. And basically what you do is you describe all the results again, which you just did in your results section. So you start the discussion, you start, you pick up the discussion with the key question you asked in your introduction, right? There we said, we need to figure out what the effect of water is on olivine. That's, you did all your measurements, you pick up, okay, olivine goes to serpentine. That has implications, and then you go back to the original with. But do not re re repeat anything. People, the people who are, who are reading it are not stupid. Follow the hourglass, discuss step by step, scale by scale, from sure to speculative, back to the original width of your introduction. Don't go beyond that width, because then it will be arm waving. Don't stop before you reach it, because it's really frustrating. I'm interested in subduction, not in serpentinite. Really, I've seen this stuff. I'm not interested. Unless you can tell me something about subduction, because that is what I'm interested in. So if you promise me seduction, then give me seduction. So the introduction may start with global warming may kill us all. Ooh, interesting, let's read this. The discussion ends with coral reef X near city Y is dead. So what? It's nice if you live in that city, it was not nice. You promise a global problem, and you give a local conclusion. Don't do that. Keep the scales in mind. Make sure in the discussion that you compare your results with all relevant previous results. If you don't do that, I guarantee you, you'll get a comment, or you will be slaughtered in the next paper. Right? If I have done experiments on, I don't know, deformation in salt, and you are writing a paper about that, and I'm reviewing it, and I don't see my name anywhere back, I'm pissed off, because I need my citation. So if you think it's rubbish what I did, fair enough, then you say, for instance, where I had all citation, thank you, is rubbish. Hammering again on the, on the hourglass. Make sure that the level of uncertainty and the amount of interpretation gradually increases while going through your discussion. Let me... There is hardly ever a discussion where I think, from beginning till the end, this is brilliant. Maybe it is, and I'm not, but let's say if I can believe the first 40-50%, then it's a useful paper. If you put the specul speculation in the beginning, and the sure, sure stuff in the end, conclusions. Um, this is this has been a matter of taste, but 
I like bullet point conclusions at the end of the paper, or a number of conclusions, one, two, seven. Um, otherwise, you simply rewrite the abstract again. And it's nice to get, again, I'm scanning. I'm scanning 90% of the papers that I read, I scan. So you want to give me the conclusions as, 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 as headlines, as sound bites. Give numbers where possible because they stand up. Make the conclusions as short as possible. Don't show off what you... If you are drawing 17 conclusions in one paper, you should have written two. Because you want as many, diff, as many papers as possible with relevant questions, otherwise they'll be ignored. Follow the hourglass. Again, you start with the small scale conclusions and you end with the large scale ones. Don't forget to draw small conclusions. Those are the ones that are best constrained. I mean, maybe you, you, you try to solve the problem about, let's say, continental extension everywhere in the world, but if you have demonstrated that the basin in which you demonstrated it, or you studied it, has an age, which is not really important for the, the end, the end uh, scale that you end up. But that is an important conclusion, put it in there. Don't forget to draw the, the small conclusions. And highlight future work opportunities, uh, mainly, uh, or uh, highlight problems that still exist, because that is the introduction of your next paper. As pointed out by myself, there is a big problem. Yeah. Acknowledges. Of course, you acknowledge everybody who helped you, but it's not a co-author. You acknowledge the reviewers, or you mention whether there were anonymous reviewers, which I hate. You acknowledge the funding agencies, and this is one that you, <laughs> that you shouldn't um, tell anyone that I told you, but it's a trick I learned from Trump. References. Um, a rule. The order in which you list multiple references in the text is chronological. You give credit to the one who started. Some journals want to have it alphabetic, but for instance, in this case, the development of plate reconstructions. It was Weber who came up with the idea, it was Hess who proved it, and it was Thorsvink who made the best one. And in that order. And if you're not using EndNote or a program like that, or Reference Manager program, start doing it now. Because I have 6,500 references now, and if I have to, first of all, it is a database in which you can search. <coughs> but for instance, if you're writing a paper, and you, especially in geology, uh, uh, the papers about geology, you easily end up with 100, 150 citations. And it's a, first of all, you can't find where, where the hell those papers are. Um, you have to edit the reference lists yourself, and those programs do that for you. So start using those programs as soon as you can. Figures. Make them attractive. Make them look cool. Make them a lot nice to look at. Make them aesthetically pleasant. If you have boring or unclear pictures uh, or, and, and images, people will not um, tend, tend to ignore it. If you have tables, make sure that the, that the axes are clear. If it's possible, put the conclusion, the, the message, in your figures. If you make PowerPoint presentations, always make sure, and you can do the same for, for figures and papers, but if you make PowerPoint presentations, then always make sure that your title is the conclusion that people should get from it. Now, most people who read papers scan it, and the figures stand out. So if your figures tell the whole story, and you can, you can just add a small title to it. Um, also to diagrams, to pictures, to whatever. Example of, or representative paleomagnetic data, or something like that. Because if you, if you see XY diagram with dots, I don't know what that is, it can be anything. You have to read the caption, forget it. But if you say this is relationship between Underwater time and mouse death. Um, it's pretty clear. 
So make sure that if you read your paper, that the pictures tell the entire story. They tell you the introduction, the region that you work in, or the, the subject that you work on. Um, and then bit by bit, you get, the, you get the data with conclusions on top of them, and then you get a conclusion. Uh, you can have a look, and uh, Albon had a, had, a, had a great conclusion figure, which told the whole story. If you see that, if I would read that paper, uh, if I would scan that paper, I would read it ba based on that one figure. So that brought the conclusion in pretty clearly. <coughs> I really like this picture. The movie was absolutely worth it. This is a win. But anyway. <laughs> Um, the reader of your paper is normally distracted and impatient as students walking into his room asking questions, as wife on the phone asking about dinner, tries to read a paper and gets email. In other words, make sure that somebody like that, which is your average professor, um, uh, gets the point of your paper directly. You have to write it perfectly. You have to write according to all the rules that, we, that, that, that Inga has discussed about the language. But the only one who is going to read your paper is, if you're lucky, your supervisor and the reviewer. And that one strange guy that is actually doing exactly the same and therefore reading it. But even those don't entirely read it. So it should be perfect, but in the end, to convey your message, you have to work on your title, your introduction, and your bullet point conclusions, and your figures. Therefore, you should put the conclusion in the title. Give quantitative results in tables of figures. Give important numbers in the abstract, easy to scan. Give full important conclusions, follow always the R glass. Because if you do that, it, as I said, for instance, if I start reading about a certain subject, I'm interested in the introduction and in the geological setting. Because that is where I get the first overview of what's going on. Once I've done that for the first five papers, I'm interested in data and in small, small scale conclusions. I don't need to, to see the large scale speculations because I can do that myself. I want to have the information. If you follow the hourglass, I can always find in the paper where that information is. Do I want the big scale? Then I start at the beginning or at the very end. Do I want the small scale? I have to be in the middle of the paper. I explained the age factor. You do not want just want to have a long list of papers there. You prefer you want them high up as well. So what this graph shows you is the paper with the most citations is listed as the first, and then it decreases the amount of the, the citations decrease. And the amount of papers above the H factor, so let's say if you have an H factor of ten, then ten papers are cited ten times or more. And publication strategy is pretty important uh, to, to get this up, to check this up. Why? Well, first of all, so what, do, what should you do when you are about to submit a paper? Or when you are thinking about it? You have, all of you have fantastic data sets, you're geniuses and you're productive, but now you want to make papers out of it. You can write one book, nobody's going to read it. Because it's not, if it's not available online, it will not be read. Journals that are not available online, don't do it. Don't go there. Books are nice if you write one because you can make money. But publishing in books is, first of all, um, it won't be read. Secondly, it's not included <coughs> in the citation count. So if you wrote a paper in a book and then it's cited 400 times, then you're an idiot because nobody knows it. So you can't show off. Secondly, make sure that the journal in which you publish is listed in <coughs> Easy and in Scopus. Because you want to know how many times it's cited. Check impact factors. Getting less important. For some universities, it is important for African <coughs> universities are paid based on the impact factor of the journal. What is the impact factor? That is the average amount of citations that a paper will get per year in the first two years after publication. Impact factor of nature is 34. That means that 
on average, a paper in Nature is cited 60, 66 times, 60, what, 68 times, two years after publication. That is huge. Science is 25. The next in Earth Sciences is Earth Science Reviews, which is six. Let's read right, so Nature, Science, Lone Sign, nothing, and then we go. EPSL is nice, four. Geology is nice, three. And the Netherlands Journal of Geosciences, 0 0.2. In other words, you have to write um, 170 papers in that to compare to one in nature. So impact factor, impact factor is mainly important if a journal has a very low impact factor that is probably for a reason. That is probably not because it has the best science. So check it out. Check, check and, and easy, you can find it, and, and, and other websites, you can find it. But not only the impact factor, make sure that you reach your audience best. For instance, if you are a structural geologist and you have done something about <laughs> sheet faults, that should sp spike a reaction, but nothing happens. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, so if, you, if you're uh, a structural geologist and you worked about faults, but you publish your paper in PDU 3, your audience is not going to read it. So you take the journal that, is, that fits best with uh, the subject that you are doing. Papers are unique problems and solutions, not just data sets. And this is an observation I made. Many PhD theses with multiple papers, normally a PhD, these are the results in, depending whether you have three or four, you have, let's say, anywhere between three and five papers. And in many cases, the first paper is cited like crazy, and the second, third, and fourth paper are ignored. If that is the case, you did something wrong. You did something wrong with your problem selection. Because normally, the big conclusion of the thesis is given away in paper number one, and the rest of the papers fill in details. Boring. So, it is better if you are working towards a big conclusion that your first paper, let's say, starts uh, two steps lower. Interesting paper grabs the attention. The second paper goes a step further. People say, ah, oh, wait a second, I like the first paper, it was an interesting problem. Let's, let's see what he has to say now. Ah, oh, we go a step further. And that way, if you build it up, or if you select different problems that you can solve with your data set, for instance, you do you study three basins with four techniques. Then you can write four techniques in basin A. Show that it's an extension of a basin that was filled in the Permian with wet sandstone. Basin B, four techniques, same conclusion. Different basin, same conclusion. Boring. Whereas if you have four techniques, you can also write a paper, a, a, a paper about technique one. That is specific, you can solve a specific problem with that. Let's say the paleo climate of the basin. Paper two, the ages of the basin. Paper three, the tectonic style of the basin. Three different problems, much better attention. And you reach different audiences. Some people are interested in climate, some are in tectonics. If you put both in one paper and you write three papers of different basins with the same conclusions, the first one might be cited, and the second and the third, nothing new. So think about the if you if you're especially if you're at the end of your PhD and you're now on the on the verge, let's say, of breaking everything down in papers and you want to do it, make a list of the problems that you try to solve. And don't solve the same problem three times. And this is in a promise to you some stupid example. So now you get the stupid example. Um, every scientist starts an analysis because you're interested in solving a problem. Not always do you end up with a data set um, that solves that problem. And sometimes the data set is just shitty and you, yeah, too bad. But sometimes you have a fantastic data set that just happens to say nothing about the problem that you wanted to solve. In that case, find another problem. Example. As part of your PhD, you want to test after how many days of frost the harbor of Oslo freezes over. What? 
because you have a major interesting problem to solve it. So you spend every day from November to March in Arkebrieke with a thermometer and a camera. Result. Between November and March there are no days of frost in Oslo that year. Problem. You cannot solve your problem. You can write one hell of a global warming paper. So just be creative with your data set. Even if you have solved your problem, just have a brainstorm session and see what other problems you can solve with it. Because I guarantee you that each and every one of you has a paper for GRL, for the, 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 the what is the, the short physics paper, uh, the physical research? Physical, physical reviews of some, some sort? GRL. Yeah? Yeah. yeah, okay, so physical review letters. That is the high, the high end, let's say. Uh, there are geology papers, there are perhaps nature, geoscience, nature and science papers in there. Maybe not in the problem that you set out to solve, but with the data set you might be able to solve a problem that can reach that journal. And if you can, you should. Because if you end up in the short four page geology, nature, science, BRL, GRL papers, that really puts you on the map. I was lucky enough to have a geology paper in my PhD thesis, and that one is A, cited like crazy, and B, I noticed that people had seen it. It has a very high visibility, so it does very much good for your own career. And that's the end of it. And if you do well, you'll get one of those. The Nobel Prize.